Hey everybody, welcome to episode 97 of the Ask Dap Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, I talk about swapping the differential on a performance pack GTI and valved exhausts. Cameron via Facebook says, my Golf 7R has 24,700 kilometers. The car doesn't stop at any speed with over 120 kilometers an hour like it used to. The pedal just gets hard and slips. I sent it to VW and they said that nothing's wrong and all they say they opened and looked at the disc and pads. The brake fluid is low. Please see pics and comment. All right, so first you're having issues around stopping over 120 kilometers an hour. Uh, for all of us Americans, uh, 120 kilometers an hour is around 75 miles an hour. So a couple thoughts. He posted some pictures in this thread where he was asking this question, and I had a couple thoughts on it. Uh, first, the pads in the rear look like they're pretty low. So, um, And at that low of a mileage, my guess is based on that amount of mileage and just what I know about Mark 7s in general from my experience, you probably drive your car like you stole it. That's just, that's just what my gut tells me. Um, and so, and even more so the fact that you're trying to stop the car from 75 miles an hour. So if you slam on the brakes enough times from 80 miles an hour, you're gonna glaze, destroy those brakes, maybe glaze them over from being overheated. Um, and that could be a big part of why it's not stopping well anymore. So what happens, what you'll, if you glaze your brakes, it just becomes from overheating. So the material is glazed over from all of that excessive heat. Uh, that's going to cause the friction materials to not uh, have obviously good friction surfaces together and that's going to cause it to not stop as well. So my gut tells me that if you replace your pads and rotors and I would say upgrade possibly to a performance set, especially for someone like you, if you're really driving the car that hard, again, based on that wear pattern, I think that's really worn brakes for a car of that mileage. And so certainly upgrading your brakes to brakes that can handle uh, the beating you're throwing at them would be my advice. You know, I'll link to obviously our brake stuff here. You're out of the country, so it's not really gonna make sense. You definitely should source your brakes locally, but for future, for anybody referencing what either what you're gonna be looking for or anybody else, I'll link to our stuff here where you can check that out. So I'm pretty sure that will solve your problem. Oh, also I wanted to touch on the brake fluid being low. Uh, brake fluid being low. So a couple things when it comes to brake fluid being low, if you are going to have low brake fluid, it means you either have a leak uh, or your brake pads are wearing. So given the wear that I'm seeing there, as your brake pads wear, the friction surface becomes thinner and thinner, which means the piston in the caliper actually pushes further out. So the fluid has to fill that gap. So as you wear your brakes, the fluid level in the reservoir will get lower and lower and lower. And then once you press the pistons back in, put new pads in, then you can top up again. You don't really want to start topping up brake fluid uh, between brake replacements unless you have a leak of some kind. Justin via YouTube says, can a limited slip diff be installed on a GTI with performance pack? I don't know the transmission codes, but it's not mentioned anywhere that it won't work. Okay, so Justin is actually a customer of ours. I also spent a little bit of time with him at European Experience. He came out to our get together and we talked for a little bit. So I have a kind of a, a feeling for who he is. Normally I don't entertain questions like this because I think they're kind of ridiculous because the cost to do it is so expensive. I don't think most people would go down the road of doing this, especially when you have a performance pack that already has a limited slip-esque differential. Uh, but I happen to think that Justin might be crazy enough to actually do this. So let's talk about this. I don't think I have a, a concrete answer, but I can tell you here's a few of my concerns around this. Um, first of all, Putting a limited slip differential in a performance pack car already has a electronic limited slip differential, kind of. Um, and so what that looks like is if we take a look here, we have a picture of a transmission. And if we take a look at this transmission, you can see on the end of where the axles are, there is a large assembly. Now that's actually what controls the locking portion of the differential. It actually functions a lot like a Haldex system. So if you're not familiar with how Haldex systems work, I shot a video that talking about that a while back. I'll link to that uh, here where you can check that out. But essentially that functions a lot like a Haldex system. Here are the things that I think are gonna be concerns if you try to swap to a 
mechanical limited slip differential, which is what he's looking to do because he feels like there's performance benefits. And I think there's some truth to that. When you're looking at pure performance, there's probably some benefits to going to going to a mechanical one versus an electronic one that, that isn't going to be functioning all the time. It's only going to kick in um, when the vehicle deems it to be necessary. So you could say there's probably some argument there one way or the other, but I think there's probably some truth to that. When we go down the road of removing a electronic limit slip, first of all, the differential on that, and I just want to talk about this. I compared manual trans a manual transmission from a performance pack car to a manual transmission from a non-performance pack car to determine what what some of the differences are, or at least what I can see on on the surface. Again, I've never taken either of these apart, so I couldn't tell you definitively what's inside, but I can tell you based on the information I'm looking at. So. The transmission cases on both the performance pack and non-performance pack transes are the same, which makes me think that any manual transmission, you know, for example, we offer the wave track ones, uh, uh, and I'll link to them here. We also have a video that we shot on our Project Mark V build showing you how to, uh, it wasn't really a DIY per se, but it shows the installation of a wave track diff. I'll link to that in the description where you can check that out if you're interested, but uh, it, it essentially, you can see kind of a, what a broken down transmission looks like. But essentially, we, that would be installed inside the transmission. So I would assume because the case is the same with maybe some minor modifications because you do have to grind out some of the case during limited slip differential install sometime, um, that, that may be a few things that need to be tweaked. With, uh, outside of that, First of all, you don't have the same axle setup, so you'd need to swap them. That's simple enough um, because you have that extension on the side of your car, so you'd probably need a different axle to be in with. But more importantly, that's the mechanical stuff, which I think is easy enough. You could easily just take a non-performance back axle and blah, 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 all that stuff. The problem lies within the ABS system, or uh, at least that's what my perspective would be. Is My concern is, you're going to end up with a bunch of lights if you try to swap in a uh, a non-performance pack trans setup, essentially, and, and a manual limited slip differential like a wave track and remove the electronic setup because basically you're going to have fault codes because it's not going to be functioning. So every time the ESP or, or any part of the track control system is trying to engage that differential, it's not going to be there. You're going to have fault codes um, and other stuff associated with that. And, and to me, there's a big question of who even knows how that's going to set off the ABS system or overall functionality in the vehicle. Now, one way to me for Justin, the one way you, that you might want to test this is get under the car, unplug that differential, drive it and see how it interacts. If it does nothing, then maybe you could do it and, and do exactly what you want. Uh, but that would be my main function is wondering exactly what's going to happen with the way everything interacts. And, and you could say maybe you just swap in um, an ABS module from a non-performance pack car. Maybe that's true. Maybe something with the, the way the ECM is programmed interacts with all that information. You know, like, there's a lot of pieces to this that I think can create questions for me. There's a lot of testing that you're gonna need to do before you actually legitimately consider it. So that would be my step. Unplug that differential if you're really serious about it. And again, Justin, I think you could be. Unplug it, drive it, put it under hard conditions that, that can potentially set off lights, even if it's not going to set off a light just by unplugging it. See if the car is going to, you know, engage ABS in a weird way uh, or, you know, apply brakes in their circumstances where, because it doesn't see the differential working properly. I don't know how any of that stuff is programmed, but again, those are all of my concerns around this type of swap. Uh, and I think the mechanical stuff is, is over to come, easy to overcome as long as you're patient and willing to kind of work through some of the kinks that you might run into, but running across the actual electronic stuff and functionality of the car driving properly is always going to be my number one concern with that. I recently did an oil change in my 2017 Mark 7 at 3,000 miles. I used the exact kit you guys are using in the video, Liquid Molly 540 and factory filter. I feel as if the car accelerates slower since the switch to 540 from 530. The gas mileage is also worse. I'm at a loss. Could it possibly be that the tolerances are so good with the new engine that the oil is a little thick? I've had experience working on cars and I feel I have a better than average amount of car sense. Any thoughts? Only thing I did different was refill the new oil from the filter housing. 
All right, so this question, I just wanna to touch on this because I think a lot of times people end up with a perception of something and uh, it's because they, they perceive what they feel to be a change and there, there definitely isn't. I mean, there's no way that you're gonna see any significant difference between 530 and 540 as far as power, uh, power output. I'm sure someone will probably argue that there was some dyno testing done uh, maybe that's true that on a dyno you might be able to see fractions of a difference, you know, as far as power output, assuming that you could even duplicate the identical conditions over and over again, um, because heat soak becomes a factor and a lot of other variables become a factor when you run a car on a dyno multiple times over and over and over again. Um, also, dynos, dynos can be tweaked pretty easily for people who are trying to skew stuff. So, um, with that said, I think there's almost no way that you could have that. I think a lot of times people are either looking for a reason and, and maybe you found you did actually legitimately get, I can't contest that you got worse fuel mileage, but the driving circumstances are almost impossible to make exactly the same driving circumstance unless you just pick the same flat road, put it on cruise control, and then verify, you know, verify that the conditions are going to be let's say as close as possible and you got a 30 or 50 mile mile range difference in a tank uh, due to, you know, due to the different oil. I, I it seems really unlikely. I've, I've never heard of this and definitely would not be something that would be big enough that you could actually feel it in the car. Shane via Facebook says, what's the difference between a valved and a non-valved exhaust? Is it something to add performance or sound? I have a 2017 Golf R. Okay, Shane. So what's the difference between a valve and a non-valved exhaust? On a Mark 7 Golf R, you already have a valved exhaust from the factory. Uh, basically what a valved exhaust does is bypasses mufflers to gain more sound. There is obviously some implication that you could add performance when you're bypassing the muffler if it adds enough of a restriction to create uh, a draw of power anyway by having that restriction. Uh, as a general rule, most cars, most VW and Audi models, especially like that Mark 7 Golf R, a cat back exhaust free flowing wouldn't give you any significant benefits. So there's really not a lot you're gonna have, have as far as power gains from that. It's more going to be the way it sounds. The reason what you're seeing is you're trying to probably buy an exhaust for your car and you're seeing valves and non-valved exhausts and there are massive cost differences because the R&D and time that have to go into creating a valved exhaust is significantly higher so you'll see significantly higher cost around that so that's probably what you're seeing so again that really boils down to uh preference and sound some people like to have the either the option or have it be quieter under the average circumstance and then, and then the valve opens up usually a wide open throttle or something like that and which you'll get more noise so it kind of keeps the car tamer under regular circumstance but makes it louder and more aggressive under heavy driving conditions is generally the purpose of valved exhausts. Thunder Gamer via YouTube says, you sadly did not mention the Passat slash Sharon. Okay, so this comment was left on a video I shot a while back talking about the top five most reliable VW models. Um, and he was coming, uh, commenting about the Passat and the Sharon, uh, or Sharon, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced. So that's a model we don't have in the US, so I can't really speak much about it. Uh, although I can talk about the Passat probably quite at length. Historically, Passats have not been the most reliable VW model to get. They've actually probably been one of the least reliable models. Uh, starting with, we'll, we can talk about the kind of the more mainstream ones, which I would think would be B5 and then B6. So let's just say B5, B6, and B7. B5 were pretty much terrible when it comes to reliability as far as longevity, they have a high maintenance cost. There's a lot of things that were kind of common problems. And because as those cars age, people who buy them tend to uh, tend to be buying a cheaper car. It's kind of a death by a thousand cuts for those people because it's it's a couple hundred, a couple hundred, a couple hundred, and then you know it, it blows them out of the water, uh, which is usually what happens with those cars. Moving on to B6 Passats. I actually personally like B6 Passats. My wife has had two of them. Um, but I would not classify them as high reliability because they had the TSI and then the FSI and uh, the FSI and the TSI 2.0 engines in them. As a general rule, they were 3.6 ones. I know people are gonna comment. They're much less common. 3.6 ones are gonna be fine and, and plenty reliable. 
when it comes to the other models other than more mainstream ones because three sixes were pretty rare here um because of how expensive they were uh the T the fsi had obviously a, a laundry list of problems we've put out plenty of info about it if you're not familiar i'll link to the article that i have talking about uh, fsi common problems here uh, and then moving into tsi uh, tsi had probably uh, maybe less broad problems but more scary problems uh, one of them actually ironically enough being the timing chain tensioner issues which we've made these shirts for a while back uh, to try to bring awareness around this problem and timing chain tensioners were a massive and still are currently a massive scary problem that's happening with tsi engines uh, you know, we urge anybody with a TSI, if, if you don't know about the problem, check out the article that we have talking about TSI common problems. That is super, super important. And the timing chain tensioner is one that while updating it is expensive, you, not updating it could cost you many thousands, you know, I would say minimum of four to $7,000 to repair. So I always urge everybody, please make sure you educate yourself on that because it is super important. And I want to make sure that nobody ends up in that bad spot because uh, we do see it fairly often. So that would be the reason why I would say that. Moving on to the B7 Passat, I actually think the B7 Passat, while isn't the most exciting uh, car because it was a US specific car that was a little bit watered down, a lot of people didn't like it because it was more price point driven as opposed to what most historically uh, VW models were. I actually like the car. Uh, I drove one for a demo for a while when I was at the dealer still I had a 2.5 which was pretty gutless in that car uh, but other than that I think a 2.5 B7 Passat is actually a solidly reliable car it's not going to give you a lot of problems gas mileage is probably not going to be very great but uh, overall it's actually a pretty good car as far as reliability quality that type of stuff um, you know while it's not the most exciting car it will get you where you want to go and probably not leave you stranded so that car I actually would qualify in that list uh, or closer to that list. It just happened to not be within the top five. Thank you so much for watching episode 97 of the Ask App Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave them in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.